the committee will come to order. This is a hearing on waste, abuse, and mismanagement in government health care. And again, um, on behalf of the witnesses and other interested uh, folks here, thank you for your indulgence uh, for all of us as we had to go vote. Uh, the Oversight Committee mission statement is as follows. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is being well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with Citizen Watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of oversight and government reform. I will uh, now recognize myself uh, and then the gentleman for, uh, from Illinois and the gentleman from Arizona for uh, opening statements. Uh, again, I want to thank our uh, distinguished uh, eclectic group of witnesses for uh, offering what I am sure is going to be wonderful insight and testimony. Congress all too often deals in abstracts, issuing directives with broad scope and limited specificity. In other words, we pass big ideas and then leave the details to unelected individuals who sometimes escape the scrutiny that comes with popular elections, thereby abdicating our constitutional role. However, this malady in the past has not been limited to our lawmaking responsibility. It is also extended into Congress's role to hold agencies accountable for glaring inefficiencies. Hopefully, we are beginning to recapture that role and, in doing so, rein in an overextended bureaucracy fraught with mismanagement and abuse. Here on the Oversight Committee, it is our duty to ask fair questions and demand honest answers, answers whose validity the American people for too long have been conditioned to doubt. At a time when the approval of Congress is historically and empir empirically abysmal, this committee has a unique opportunity to begin the arduous process of re-inspiring trust in the institutions of government. That process begins with rooting out areas of waste, no nowhere more prevalent than in government health care. The American people expect government to be responsible stewards of taxpayer dollars and devoted practitioners of honest introspection. However, in the areas of Medicare and Medicaid, we have utterly failed in both regards. In the past, oversight has followed a basic path. We identify a broken problem, program, seek to expose the underlying cracks in its foundation, and explore possible avenues to rectify the problems. We ask why, what are the root causes, and what can be done to fix the problem. In this case, however, many of those questions have already been asked and answered, and yet nothing has been accomplished. Since 1990, GAO has identified both Medicare and Medicaid as high-risk programs, highlighting a path that is fiscally unsustainable over the long term. The GAO also found pervasive internal control deficiencies that put billions of taxpayer dollars at risk of improper payments or waste. From delaying the implement implementation of Higgless accounting system to ignoring GAO recommendations designed to address improper payment vulnerabilities, CMS has repeatedly failed to properly confront these financial failures a burden that falls not on the Federal bureaucrat's task with enacting these reforms, but on American taxpayers across the country. Both Medicare and Medicaid are in desperate need of fundamental, wholesale, systemic reform. They serve as two principal drivers of our crippling burden of debt at a time when economic uncertainty threatens our Nation's fiscal security. Something simply has to be done. However, full-scale reform is not the purpose of this hearing. We are seeking to identify areas of inefficiency and determine why common sense recommendations calculated to decrease exorbitant cost have continuously been ignored. Trust must be earned, and addressing mistakes of the past is an important first step in that process. The American people expect that when money is spent, it is spent properly, and when areas of mismanagement are discovered, they are promptly and adequately corrected. However, recent failures have left them frustrated frustrated at the persistent waste, frustrated with the lack of remedy, consequence, and accountability, frustrated by a problem that is so illustrative of a broken, wasteful Federal bureaucracy. Today, I hope we can begin the process of addressing that frustration and begin to rebuild citizens' trust in the institutions of government. And with that, I would yield 
to the gentleman from Illinois for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you, first of all, for holding this hearing, which I consider to be vitally important. As a Chicago native, I have long focused on the problems of the inner city poor and disabled. The 7th Congressional District, in which I live, is the largest medical center district in the country, with 21 hospitals, four medical schools, and 104 community health centers. Specifically in my district, the Affordable Care Act, which I strongly supported, improved health insurance coverage for 334,000 residents and closed Medicare's prescription donut hole for 76,000 seniors. Additionally, it extended coverage to 52,000 uninsured residents and has reduced the cost of uncompensated care for hospitals and other health care providers by $222 million annually. At a time when 13 million older Americans are considered economically insecure and our constituents are grappling with unemployment and the effects of the economic downturn, I am at a loss when some in Congress are pushing to reduce or eliminate basic health care services for vulnerable Americans. Make no mistake, a repeal of the Affordable Care Act and deficit reduction proposals targeting Medicare and Medicaid will equate to an assault aimed at women, the sick, and the poor. In 2009, over 365,000 Americans were on waiting lists in 39 states to join the 3 million aged and disabled individuals receiving long-term care services in nursing homes and in home health care settings. I am concerned that today's hearing reportedly focused on waste, abuse and mismanagement in government health care is less about constructive proposals to fight fraud and is more about the House Republican leadership's campaign to cut Medicare and Medicaid. For the record, this is the fourth hearing in a row in the House on this topic, with three identical hearings held in recent weeks by the Energy and House Committee, the Committee on Ways and Means, and finally, the Committee on Appropriations. It is clear to this member that the Republican leadership has given messages to rank and file members for its campaign to slash Medicare and Medicaid. Certainly, targeting waste and abuse in Medicare and in Medicaid is an important and bipartisan effort. I note that in February, a multi-agency anti-fraud effort coordinated under the auspices of the Administration's Health Care Fraud Prevention and Enforcement Action Team, known as HEAT, resulted in criminal charges being brought against 111 individuals who allegedly defrauded the Medicare program out of $225 million through false billing claims and kickback operations. As a proud supporter of the Affordable Health Care Act, which contained essential funding and new tools for agencies to fight health care fraud, I am especially pleased that the HEAT initiative has recently expanded to Chicago. Again, I thank the witnesses for joining us today and look forward to their testimony and to this hearing. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Members may have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. We will now welcome our first panel of witnesses, and it is my pleasure to introduce them from my left to right. Ms. Deborah Taylor is the Chief Financial Officer and the Director of the Office of Financial Management at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Dr. Peter Budetti, is that close? is Deputy Administrator for Program Integrity and Director of CMS Center for Program Integrity at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Mr. Gerald Roy is Deputy Inspector General for Investigations in the Office of Inspector General at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. 
And the Honorable Loretta Lynch is the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of New York. I will, um, as uh, is customary, uh, ask the witnesses to rise and uh, receive the oath, and then we will hear from you. You raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? May the record reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you. And we will, uh, I am sure that you are uh, familiar with this process. There should be three lights that are reasonably visible to you. Um, the, uh, the yellow light is kind of a, a slowdown light, and the red light, uh, particularly given the, the time, in fact, we have another panel, I would, I would ask you to admire, adhere to that as, as closely as you can. And, Starting with Ms. Taylor, we will have five minutes for opening statement. Your full statement will be made part of the record, so if you don't get to all of it, do, don't think for one moment that it won't be read. It will be. So we will start with Ms. Taylor and then work our way down the table. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services efforts to prevent and recover improper payments. CMS is committed to reducing waste and abuse in the Medicare program and ensuring that our programs pay the right amount for the right service to the right person in a timely manner. It is important to remember that most errors are not fraud. These errors generally result from the following situations. One, a provider fails to submit any documentation or submits insufficient documentation to support the services paid. Second, services provided are incorrectly coded on the claim. And third, documentation submitted by the provider shows the services were not ne reasonably necessary. CMS is committed to reducing improper payments, and we have developed many corrective actions to resolve and eliminate these improper payments in the future. CMS has extensive prepayment edits and other review activities to identify some improper payments. However, with close to 5 million claims being processed each day, CMS may cannot manually review every claim before it is paid, so we must rely on other techniques. One important tool in our efforts to recover improper payments is the Recovery Audit Program. In this program, recovery auditors work to identify overpayments and underpayments in the Medicare program. Recovery auditors are paid on a contingency fee basis, which means they are paid based on a percentage of the total amount of claims they correct. The Medicare Modernization Act of 2003 required that we establish a recovery audit demonstration to pilot the potential usefulness of recovery auditing in the Medicare fee-for-service program. During the demonstration project, the recovery auditors corrected over a billion dollars in improper payments, including returning and collecting overpayments in the sum of $990 million. Congress expanded the Recovery Audit Program in the Tax Relief and Health Care Act of 2006, directing CMS to implement a National Recovery Audit Program by January 2010. We considered the lessons learned from the demonstration in establishing the national program. It was important that we design a national program around five key elements, minimizing provider burden, ensuring accuracy of the audits, auditor's determinations, establishing an efficient and effective process, tracking and correcting program vulnerabilities, and ensuring program transparency. I would like to talk a little bit about some of the specific actions we took. To address provider burden issues related to voluminous requests for medical records, we established limits to the number of medical records an auditor could request from a provider within 45-day time period. We also required that every recovery auditor hire a physician medical director. This gives physicians additional assurance that the claim denial decisions are accurate. To improve program transparency, we created a recovery audit website. This website contains valuable information to providers about where errors are occurring and the reason for those errors. And lastly, we wanted to address recovery audit concerns around um, pervasive incentives to over-identify improper payments. So now we require that recovery auditors must refund any contingency fee related to dec decisions overturned on appeal. Although the national program is relatively new, we have already seen significant benefits from it. To date, the program has collected 
or corrected a total of $365 million in improper payments. Of that, $313 million is related to overpayments that have been collected. Another benefit of the program is identifying vulnerabilities where policy changes, systems changes, and provider education and outreach are needed to prevent improper payments in the future. We are taking aggressive actions to address these vulnerabilities, and we have done many systems changes to stop payments from going out the door. We will, I am confident that the National Recovery Program and ongoing corrective actions we have in place will continue to reduce improper payments. Thank you, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Uh, thank you. Dr. Budetti. Chairman Gowdy, uh, Ranking Mem Member Davis, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to discuss our work at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, to reduce fraud, waste, and abuse in our programs. I am delighted to be here, accompanied by my uh, colleague uh, Deborah Taylor from CMS, uh, Deputy Inspector General Roy, and U.S. Attorney uh, Lynch, who are very close uh, colleagues in uh, the fight against fraud, waste, and abuse. From the first day that I had the privilege to take this job a little over a year ago, I have been asked two questions. Why do, I let, why do we let crooks into our programs? And why do we keep paying them after they get into the program when we think their claims are fraudulent? I'm pleased to tell you that with the new authorities that uh, have been provided in recent laws uh, and the commitment of this administration to fight fraud in our programs, we will be keeping the people who don't belong there out of our programs, and we will be rejecting fraudulent claims before they are paid. We now have the flexibility to tailor our resources to the most serious problems and to quickly initiate activities uh, that will be transformative uh, in bringing about the, uh, the uh, results that I have mentioned. Under the leadership of Secretary Sebelius, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have taken several administrative steps to better meet emerging needs and challenges in fighting fraud and abuse. CMS consolidated the Medicare and the Medicaid program integrity groups under a unified Center for Program Integrity, which I have the privilege to, uh, to direct. This allows us to pursue a more coordinated and integrated set of program integrity activities across both programs. This has served both our program integrity activities well, this reorganization, as well as our ability to collaborate with our law enforcement colleagues uh, in the Office of the Inspector General and the Department of Justice. The Affordable Care Act greatly enhanced this organizational change by providing us with the opportunity to jointly develop Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP policies on these new authorities. Affordable Care Act provisions such as enhanced screening requirements apply across the programs, and this ensures better consistency in CMS's approach to fraud prevention. Some might believe that an organizational change uh, is of questionable value, but I can tell you that creating a center for program integrity that is on par with other major operational units within the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services sends a powerful message about our serious commitment to fighting fraud and also puts the bad actors on notice. We have made sure that our sights are fixed on the goals that we want to accomplish, and I would draw your attention to the chart uh, that uh, illustrates our new approach that, sh uh, that we are pursuing. Number one, we are embarking on a number of changes that will allow us to move beyond our traditional way of fighting fraud, which is known as pay and chase, to prevent problems in the first place and to avoid them from, taking, from occurring. Second, we will not take a monolithic approach to dealing with fraud. We are focusing on the bad actors who pose an elevated risk of fraud. Third, we are taking advantage of innovation and sophisticated new technology as we focus on prevention. Fourth, commitment with this consistent with this administration's commitment to being transparent and accountable, we are developing performance measures that will specify our targets for improvement. Five, we are actively engaging public and private partners because there is much to learn from others who are engaged in the same endeavor of fighting fraud in health care programs. And six, we are committed to coordination and integration among all of the CMS programs drawing on best practices and lessons learned. We are concentrating our actions so that we are doing a better job of preventing bad actors from enrolling in the first place, avoiding fraudulent or other improper payments, 
and working to achieve the President's goal of cutting uh, the error rate in Medicare uh, Parts A and B by 50 percent by 2012. We are taking advantage of today's cutting-edge tools and technologies to help us at the front end and throughout the implementation of our programs. In doing this, one point bears stressing. We are mindful of the necessity to be fair to health care providers and suppliers who are our partners in caring for beneficiaries and to protect beneficiary access to necessary health care services. We will always respect the fact that the vast majority of health care providers are honest people who provide critical health care services to millions of CMS beneficiaries every day. Mr. Chairman, I welcome this opportunity to appear before the subcommittee, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Mr. Roy. Good afternoon, Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Davis, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I am Gerald Roy, Deputy Inspector General for Investigations at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Inspector General. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss fraud within the Medicare and Medicaid programs. OIG is committed to protecting the integrity of more than 300 programs administered by HHS. The Office of Investigations employs over 450 highly skilled special agents who utilize state-of-the-art investigative technologies and a wide range of law enforcement actions. We are the Nation's premier health care fraud law enforcement agency. Over the past 16 years, I have served in every capacity from field agent to the special agent in charge of the Los Angeles region to agency head. It is from this, per this perspective that I will share my observations and experiences. As a new OIG agent in 1996, I investigated a case that took me from Southern California to Miami. I gathered evidence on a father and daughter team that had worked for several years to steal almost $1 million. The investigation and the prosecution took more than three years. The father, a former drug dealer, told us he found stealing from Medicare far safer and more lucrative than trafficking. Their scheme was simple. They used handwritten lists of beneficiary numbers to submit paper claims for durable medical equipment they never provided. Both ultimately pled guilty to health care fraud and conspiracy charges. Sixteen years later, I see this same general scheme on a grander, more sophisticated scale. Today, such schemes go viral. That is, they replicate, spread quickly, with national implications. Perhaps the most challenging and disturbing trend is the infiltration of Medicare by sophisticated, organized criminal networks and violent criminals who have little fear of law enforcement and view prison time as a badge of honor. In Los Angeles, Eurasian organized criminals rely on stolen physician identities and compromised beneficiary numbers to perpetrate fraud. In 2003, we had nearly 2,500 compromised beneficiary numbers shared electronically around Southern California. By 2007, that number was well in excess of 100,000. With these compromised numbers, criminals can steal well over a million dollars in 90 days without ever filing a single sheet of paper or providing a single service. In one case, they had ties to employees at a Medicare provider enrollment. These pictures you see here show weapons seized during a health care fraud search warrant. When I joined OIG, this criminal element and their tactics were unheard of. Throughout my tenure at OIG, major corporations and institutions have committed health care fraud on a grand scale. Today, what is most troubling is the possibility that some unethical health care corporations build civil fines and penalties into their cost of doing business. They may believe they are too big to be fired, as to do so may compromise the welfare of our beneficiaries. As long as the profit from fraud outweighs punitive costs, abusive behavior is likely to continue. Built on trust, Medicare has allowed enrollment of any willing provider, and fraud perpetrators have exploited this. OIG has long advocated strengthening enrollment standards, making participation a privilege not a right. Also, those who steal from Medicare often perceive a low risk of detection and minimal penalties compared to street-level crimes. However, reinvigorated partnerships and an emphasis on this issue by our stakeholders, including DOJ and CMS, reinforce my belief that a sustained effort will make significant strides towards eradicating fraud. 
Together, we are utilizing new techniques to combat fraud. We now catch criminals in the act, conduct investigations, and prosecute offenders in a fraction of the time. At OIG, we protect the Nation's most vulnerable citizens and the Federal health care programs they depend on. OIG special agents diligently and effectively investigated health care fraud long before this issue hit the national spotlight. We will be here for the American taxpayers, even if that spotlight fades. However, from my perspective, we cannot afford to let up. Sustained efforts and continued interest by law enforcement, prosecutors, CMS, Capitol Hill, and the American taxpayers is paramount to our future success. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roy. We will now recognize uh, Madam United States Attorney, Ms. Lynch. Thank you, and good afternoon, Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Davis, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today about the Department of Justice efforts to combat health care fraud. I am honored to appear before you on behalf of the Department of Justice, along with my colleagues from HHS, OIG, and CMS. As you know, the United States attorneys and their assistant U.S. attorneys are the principal prosecutors of Federal crimes, including health care fraud. We represent the Department of Justice and the interests of the American taxpayer in both criminal and civil cases in the Federal courts in the 94 judicial districts across the country. The Department's civil attorneys, both in the U.S. Attorney's offices and the Department's civil division, aggressively pursue civil enforcement actions to root out fraud and recover funds stolen in health care fraud schemes. Since the year 2000, the U.S. Attorney's offices, working with our civil division colleagues, as well as with the FBI, HHS, OIG, and other Federal, State, and local law enforcement agencies, have recovered over $1 billion every year on behalf of defrauded Federal health care programs. And in fiscal year 2010, the Department secured approximately $2.5 billion in civil health care fraud recoveries, more than in any other previous year. Working with our colleagues in the Criminal Division, our criminal health care fraud efforts have also been a tremendous success. In FY 2010, this Department-wide coordination led to the largest number of criminal health care fraud convictions since the inception of the HICFAC program. Today, our criminal enforcement efforts are at an all-time high. In FY 2010, the Department brought criminal charges against 931 defendants and secured 726 criminal health care fraud convictions. The Medicare Fraud Strike Force is a supplement to the Department's successful criminal health care fraud enforcement efforts and is currently operating in nine districts, including my own district of Brooklyn. Each district has allocated several AUSAs and support personnel to this important initiative and partners with the criminal division attorneys, as well as with agents from the FBI, HHS, and State law enforcement. The strike force teams use data analysis techniques to identify aberrational billing patterns in strike force cities, permitting law enforcement to target emerging or migrating schemes, along with chronic fraud by criminals operating as health care providers or suppliers. This model is working. The strike force initiative has been an unqualified success. In FY 2010, the strike forces secured 240 convictions, more than in any other year of strike force operations. EDNY strike force criminal prosecutions cover a variety of health care fraud schemes, including kickbacks to patients. The principal focus of the Medicare fraud strike force in Brooklyn has been to shut down medical clinics that pay cash kickbacks to dual Medicare Medicaid beneficiaries. To lure these beneficiaries to the clinics through the illegal use of transportation services reimbursed by Medicaid and then illegally bill Medicare for services either medically unnecessary or never provided. I have included three of those major cases in my written testimony. Coordination of our health care fraud enforcement resources works. AUSAs in the U.S. Attorney's offices, trial attorneys in the civil and criminal divisions, FBI and HHS agents, as well as other Federal, State and local law enforcement partners are working together across the country with great success. Since the HICFAC program was established, working together, the two Departments have returned over $18 billion to the Medicare Trust Fund. Over the life of the HICFAC program, 
the average return on investment, or ROI, has been $4.90 for every dollar expended. Very good, but through our enhanced efforts over the past three years, the average ROI has been even higher. As reported in the HICFAC Program's annual report for FY 2010, the average ROI for 2008 through 2010 was actually $6.80 for every dollar expended, nearly $2 higher than the historical average. We are poised to continue these successes in the months and years ahead, and we look forward to working with our Federal, State, and local partners to that end. Mr. Chairman, thank you for this opportunity to provide this overview of the Department's health care fraud enforcement efforts. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I would at this point uh, recognize the distinguished gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes of questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank uh, each of the witnesses for their testimony. Um, Dr. Bernetti, it seems to me that um, since the organization of CMS, that one of its primary focuses has been on cost containment, that there has been much conversation over an extended period of time about reducing the cost of health care and containing the cost. Uh, it has been difficult to do. What would you consider to be the, the primary elements of fraud in, in the Medicare, Medicaid programs? Thank you, Mr. Davis. I think, as uh, uh, Mr. Roy uh, alluded to, uh, we have seen uh, the evolution of a new uh, generation of fraudsters uh, in these programs. We have had problems with uh, major uh, health care uh, entities, uh, companies, and, uh, and uh, uh, delivery systems and so forth for many years, of course. But more recently, what we have seen is the criminal element coming into the programs and taking advantage of the fact that Medicare and Medicaid really were open for, uh, for providers and suppliers to join in order to take care of our beneficiaries as necessary. So we have seen a shift, and I think that that is a very troubling uh, but important thing for us to recognize, that now we are not just dealing with the kinds of problems that we faced in the past where somebody is going to be in business a few years down the road and we have a few years to track after them and audit them and try to recover uh, or prosecute them, but where they are criminals who are going to disappear very quickly. And so we need to be able to deal with both kinds of, uh, of fraud these days uh, and be nimble and, and stay ahead of the ones uh, who just don't belong in the programs at all. Are there loopholes in, in our system? that not only attract but kind of give individuals the idea that there are ways to defraud the system? Well, I think one of the loopholes was not a loophole, but it was a deliberate uh, part of the program, which, as I mentioned, was a relative ease of getting providers and suppliers into the program so that they could take care of beneficiaries. I think in terms of the way that programs are organized and structured and funded, however they are structured, somebody is going to look for the vulnerabilities. And it has got to be our job to stay ahead of them and to figure out where the vulnerabilities are. No matter how we uh, organize and pay for health care, there are going to be people, unfortunately, who will try to steal from us. And they will look at however the money is flowing uh, and try to figure out a way to go after that money. So I think we need to be aware of all of the incentives, the financial incentives, the organizational structures, every aspect of the program, but I think it is uh, not unique to any aspect of it. Attorney Lynch, let me ask you. There used to be a time, and, and I guess there still is, when, when there were what was called Medicaid meals, where practitioners just kind of had running streams of individuals coming through their clinics and uh, they were just seriously ripping off uh, the public. Are we still finding those? I think we are seeing attempts to recreate them. I think the benefits of the Department's recent efforts have been partnering with CMS and HHS. We have been able to use techniques that get us quicker data 
so that we can and we hope to intercept these Medicaid and Medicare mills as they are operating and move in to shut them down quickly. The problem, of course, is, as Dr. Budetti has intimated, is these organizations will spring up, close, and then reemerge under a different name. So with the increased tracking that we have been able to utilize with our partners, we think we are doing much better at finding these clinics and finding these doctors, uh, but it is still a continual problem. Quickly, Mr. Roy, um, could you think of some recommendations based upon your experiences that might be helpful to implement as to further reduce the opportunities for fraud and abuse? Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. In, in my experience and as I spoke in my, uh, to in my testimony, for me personally, it all comes down to provider enrollment. It, it, it really comes down to ensuring that those people that come into our program are there to, to serve uh, our, our Medicare beneficiaries. It seems to be a, a theme throughout my, my tenure at OIG that those who wish to perpetrate fraud recognize the low barrier to entry and, the, and, and they exploit that to the maximum. So I would, I would recommend the concentration on a provider enrollment uh, aspect of the program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, the Chair would now recognize uh, the gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. Mr. Roy, would you agree with this uh, a description of fraud, misusing a process to gain a financial advantage? Yes, sir. How about you, Ms. Lynch? I think that is part of the description of fraud. Obviously, when it comes to criminal fraud, we would have to have intent requirements. But, yes, that is part of the description of fraud. What if it was the government? Would that still qualify in a process? Let me go a little deeper. How about that? How do we audit uh, our federally qualified health centers? I am going to give you some personal experiences, just so you know. I am a dentist. I have been practicing 25 years until last year. Why on the WIC program would it take a single mom most of the time five or six visits to see the doctor, repeated entry, not on the same day? Why would we take a child with a full mouthful of decay and only allow one tooth to be taken care of one at a time? Can you describe why we would do that? How about you, doctor? You are talking about processes. What, what kind of process would mandate this kind of care? I am not familiar with, uh, with those policies, uh, Dr. Kozar, but uh, Do you know what an encounter I, is? I can yes, yes, sir. I Why can, would that be misused? I can understand your concern if that is what, uh, uh, what, you, what you were uh, observing. I am alluding exactly to that. Why would we What is the purpose of an encounter? The purpose of an encounter, yeah. uh, sir, of course, is to uh, deal with uh, the, the patient and, what, and the issues the patient has and try to take care of them. How about we take five different visits for a WIC woman? to be able to fill out a health history, and that took five weeks, five different visits for an encounter. Would you not call that fraud? I am not familiar with the situation that you are describing, but I certainly don't, that certainly doesn't uh, strike me as, uh, as the, uh, the best way to go about business of taking care of patients, sir. When you look at processes, how do we review the, the process when we are looking at um, FQHCs? You said that you constantly are updating and looking at processes. How do we look at that process? In, uh, in, in our uh, area, uh, sir, uh, the, uh, the work that we are doing uh, focuses principally on both uh, Medicare uh, payments and, uh, and Medicaid payments. And so we look at uh, the way that the money flows and look for uh, patterns of, uh, of problems, no matter where the money is going. Uh, so we, we're, 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 we intend to look, uh, no matter where the money is going, uh, I can't tell you that, uh, that I'm familiar with a uh, particular emphasis on, uh, on the kinds of issues that you're talking about, but certainly we're looking uh, at all of the ways that the money is flowing and, uh, and the possibilities for problems like that. What kind of audit do you do on a federally qualified health center or a health center? Um, and when are they done? Are they announced or are they unannounced? I would have, have to get you specific information on that, sir. It is not something that uh, I am personally uh, familiar with at this point. I wonder if I was to tell you that it is standing procedure, that what we do is we have standing patients that come in to see services on Medicaid and they are supposed to be seen first come, first serve, and they sit all day long and they just get transferred to a hospital and they are isolated to one segment of the day. 
Wouldn't you call that fraud? I'm not. Uh, it's a process, uh, right? It, it's, it, it sounds like a, it's an inappropriate process, right? It sounds like a, pro a process that uh, would need some attention to me the way you describe it, sir. Yes. Mr. Roy, you said that you look and review these kind of processes. Would this be something that you've looked into before? Sir, uh, Office of Investigations does not look into such processes. How, do you, um, how would you have to go back into looking at them? I am an investigator. Our office investigates fraud and, and brings those cases to, to a criminal prosecutor, either, either at the Federal or State level. The, the audit process would be from another component within our OIG. And where would that come from? Our Office of Audit. And I am more than happy to find out and get additional information uh, for you on that process. Mrs. Lynch, would we, would we persecute that individual that was the head of that health center for that kind of misuse of patients? Congressman, I hope that we don't persecute anyone. Uh, I mean, but, I'm prosecute, I'm sorry. It has been a long day. <laughs> that is okay. I'm sorry. Um, on the facts as you have described, I simply don't have enough information. It certainly sounds like an inefficient process, but I would have to know more about it. But if we had an administrator misusing the process, fraud, that is misusing a process for a financial aspect and an upward gain. That seems to me like we got to do a better, much better job on that, because we are seeing a lot of this. It is not just the private sector, it is also the government and the entities that it, it pays. I yield back my time. I uh, thank the gentleman from Arizona. Uh, the Chair would now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, the ranking member of the full Oversight Committee, Mr. Cummings. First of all, I want to thank the witnesses for your testimony. Um, and as I listened to Mr. Gosar, I could not help but think about the young boy in Maryland, Diamante Driver, who died three or four years ago because he could not get a doctor, Medicaid doctor, to treat him. Eighty dollars worth of treatment uh, would have saved his life. He eventually died. Um, and his mother was in search of somebody to treat him. And I guess as I listened to those questions, I had to change my own line of questioning because I want to make sure that we focus where the fraud is. Ms. Lynch, I'm sorry, yes, Attorney Lynch, um, I really appreciate what you said when you talked about uh, in FY 2010 the Department secured approximately $2.5 billion in civil health care fraud recoveries. And I think before that it had been what around, what was the highest before that? It was roughly around $1 billion per year. $1 million. Billion, sir. $1 billion, I'm sorry. And I'm trying to figure out what, um, I assume you believe, first of all, that is great. That is congratulations uh, to the Department and to all the people that work so hard to accomplish that. I assume you believe that there is more to be done? I, I do. I and do. what kind of tools do you need to accomplish that? Because we on, on both, first of all, on both sides of the aisle, we want to see this fraud, waste and abuse addressed. And we wanted to see it addressed on every level. And as you answer me, I just want to just mention that the Coalition Against Insurance Fraud estimates that 80 percent of health care fraud is committed by providers and 10 percent by consumers. The remaining 10 percent is thought to be committed by others, such as insurance companies or their employees. And so I am just wondering, um, what, uh, what do you see, what can we do to uh, address this issue, issue in an even more effective and efficient pattern manner. Thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Cummings. I think that the President's budget outlines several provisions that would increase the resources being brought to bear on this problem and that would allow us to expand the strike force system, for one, which would be an important tool in targeting the transitory nature of this fraud, the emerging nature of this fraud and the ever-evolving nature of this fraud. Another important initiative currently pending, uh, the Affordable Health Care Act did request or actually did mandate that the Sentencing Commission put forth a schedule for higher sentences for those individuals convicted of health care fraud based upon the amount of false billings, not just what they actually received, sometimes that is less than the amount actually billed, but the Sentencing Commission was directed to, in fact, revise the guidelines to cover the amount billed, as well as to raise the guidelines for the type of fraud that we are seeing. We think these are important resources and tools that the Department would use in fighting this battle. Now, I assume that when you spend a certain amount of money to uh, go after folks, there is a yield. In other words, there is a benefit that comes back uh, in the form of prevention. 
hopefully the message gets out, but also in the, in the form of dollars. And I was just wondering if, you, if the budget is, is uh, cut substantially, say, for example, the strike force that you talked about. We actually are kind of, we, I mean, if, if that's the situation where you can actually show, I guess, where X dollars spent yields X dollars. Um, we are kind of, I mean, if we in the Congress slash your budget, I guess we are kind of working against ourselves. Is that right? Well, I think we are certainly working against the public fisc. Mm -hmm. I think it has been documented that, as I mentioned, over the last three years, the HICFAC fund is returning almost $7 uh, back for every dollar spent. A lot of that money has been allocated since 2008, I believe. And so if we were to reduce or eliminate certain funding streams, we would severely curtail our efforts to go after this fraud. Of course, we would keep the focus up. We would still work these cases, but we would have fewer resources to do them, fewer people with which to do these cases. And obviously, I think the return to the American taxpayer would be significantly diminished. I think it was you, Mr. Roy, who said that the these folks who are involved in this criminal activity uh, a lot of times see um, getting caught, it reminds me of drug deal, the big drug cartels, they see getting caught as a part of the tax they pay. And um, so, so they, they, don't, they, they are, are committed to accomplishing this because they see the benefits are so great. Absolutely, sir. Thank you for the question. The Eurasian organized crime element in Los Angeles, when I was a special agent in charge out there and an assistant special agent in charge, this criminal element had no fear of law enforcement whatsoever. And indeed, when they were caught and sentenced to jail, they considered it a badge of honor. And in fact, what they would do is they would have Mickey Mouse tattooed on their arms behind bars to signify that they had done time in a U.S. jail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. At this point, the Chair would recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. I thank the Chairman and uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Roy, uh, now, the incidence of fraud in uh, different types of Medicare programs are, are fall in different rates. Is that correct? I would say so, yes, sir. Is, uh, for instance, uh, Part D. Uh, Medicare Part D. Is, the, is there a higher level of incidence of fraud um, in, in that program than compared to the rest of Medicare? Right now, we see the emphasis in terms of fraud on durable medical equipment. Certainly, Part D is up there. Home health seems to be an area of Medicare where perpetrators like to prey. And I also would go back to the corporate fraud element in terms of the, the tremendous amount of dollars and the, uh, the, the corporate culture that goes along with that. I would say those are some of the, the, the top areas of fraud, but, but I think certainly Part D falls within that realm. Okay. Uh, meaning uh, it, you compare it to A and B, for instance, uh, w what part of Medicare actually has the highest incidence uh, according to your study and research? Durable medical equipment right now. Okay. Um, and where do those payments come from? Which, which component of Medicare? They come from Part B. Part B? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so comparing Part B to Part D, uh, which has a higher, higher incidence of, of fraud? C clearly Part B overall, yes, sir. Part B overall. Now, is there something different about the construct of those two programs that, or is it, um, or is it, for instance, what they are paying for. Uh, is, is there something different about those two that would lead a greater component of, of taxpayers paying more for the program? I, I would say that one of, the, one, of the, one of the issues on why Part B would be higher than Part D is simply because Part D is, is a newer program. We are looking at um, the prescription drug uh, benefit, which is Part D, is considerably newer than Part B, and the schemes haven't developed uh, yet uh, as they have in our Part B programs. Interesting. Okay. Ms. Taylor, is that similar to what your findings? Well, we or your experience, I should say. Yes. Um, I think in the Part D program, we do find some issues. Um, there, but for the most part, the the errors that we identify are mostly in the DME, the durable medical equipment arena, um, which is the Part B program. Yes. Okay, Mr. Roy, is there something intrinsic about the relationship between um, Medicare 
and providers and patients? Is there something intrinsic in, in the construct of the program that leads to greater incidence of fraud? That is an interesting question. Not that I can point my, put my finger on. Okay. I mean, is, you know, for instance, you know, if, if you are writing, uh, if Medicare is required to stroke a check um, on, on a base amount of proof that, that a device has been delivered or a service has been rendered, um, you know, is there a way to change how that is structured? Go back to what I said earlier about, again, keeping a better eye on who we let into our program. We need to, we need to screen and scrutinize our providers be better. That is my, my opinion. Okay. So private sector providers of health care, like, you know, compare uh, CMS to, you know, one of the, the blues or one of the uh, other health care providers. Do they have a similar level of uh, incidence of fraud? I am not familiar with what, what is happening in the private sector. Uh, OIG for HHS, we, we concentrate on, on Medicare. And clearly, sometimes we will be partnering with, with those entities, law enforcement entities that have oversight and work in, in, in the private sector health care fraud arena as well. But uh, there is nothing, I, I, I am not the person to say that those involved in, in Medicare fraud, uh, you know, exponentially more than what we see in the private sector. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance. I uh, would be happy to yield my time to the Chairman if he has, if you would like it. I thank the gentleman from North Carolina, and I will uh, keep that in mind. I am going to go last. Um, if there is anybody here when I go, I uh, will keep that in mind. I would uh, yield to, uh, at this point, to the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Taylor, I just want to get a couple of facts on the table so we have a clear understanding of the Medicaid program. Medicaid uh, covers about 60 million at-risk Americans. Is that right? Um, I believe it is around 40 to 50, but it is in that ballpark. Yes. Yes. And covers about uh, half of all of the long-term care expenses, half of all the nursing expenses in the country. Correct. It has a larger part, yes. About a third uh, of the money goes into community services, and about half of all Medicaid recipients are kids, right? Um, I, I am not a Medicaid expert, but I am not sure about that number, but I assume it is probably a large chunk of children, yes. I guess I, I, I ask these questions because uh, what I see is a disconnect here today. Um, this is an incredibly important hearing. But there is, I think, a gap between a very worthy discussion that we are having here today and what happened earlier today, where my Republican friends outlined a proposal to essentially end the Medicaid program as we know it and dramatically cut Medicaid funds for kids, for seniors in nursing homes, for States. Uh, and essentially uh, result in uh, millions of vulnerable seniors and children uh, losing access to our health care system. I think this is a really important conversation, but it happens on the same day that we are talking about essentially ending uh, preventative health care services and crisis health care services for a lot of vulnerable Americans. And to uh, Ranking Member Cummings' question, there also seems to be a disconnect between the budget debate that we are happening that we're having today, in which we are talking about potentially dramatically cutting the budgets for many of your agencies while asking you to do more with respect to fraud uh, and abuse. And in addition, to the bottom line numbers that are being cut out of your budgets. There are also riders to the continuing resolution, including the repeal of uh, the Health Reform Act. And as we have talked about, there are some incredibly important provisions in that Act which bolster your efforts. And so uh, it is a frustrating hearing today because we are talking about radical changes to Medicare and Medicaid being proposed today that will withdraw services from millions of vulnerable Americans. And we are talking about cutting your budgets at the same time that we are holding multiple hearings in the Capitol uh, about asking you to do more. Um, and, and I guess I would pick uh, uh, Representative Cummings hit on a couple issues uh, here, but um, I guess I would pick one piece out of the Health Care Reform Act that would go away, 
with the continuing resolution as passed originally through the House of Representatives and, and pose the question maybe to Mr. Roy and, and to Attorney Lynch. And, uh, that is the element of the uh, Health Care Reform Act that focuses on data sharing really important uh, piece of understanding fraud and trying to make sure that uh, all agencies, whether they be at the Federal or State level, have the information uh, that they need uh, to try to track fraud and to uh, address it when necessary. And so I guess I would ask both Mr. Roy and to Attorney Lynch, how important uh, are the provisions uh, of the Affordable Care Act with respect to increasing data sharing? And do you have worries, uh, should that act be repealed, whether you have the resources necessary uh, to try to track information as it moves through the system? Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Um, I would say that, yes, repeal of those particular provisions would, in effect, harm our efforts to eradicate fraud. In particular, data sharing is important because as CMS and HHS are working on their processes, they are able to provide to us, the prosecutors, almost real-time data on claims that are being made. And if we can identify those fraudulent claims as they are going into the system, we have a much greater chance of stopping them before they get to the large numbers that we are seeing currently. We also have a much greater chance of identifying the players. Uh, as I mentioned before, they do tend to shut down and, mo and move on. Um, this would allow us to identify those players, those fraudsters, much earlier. Um, so for us, for the Depart from the Department's perspective, the data sharing provisions of the Affordable Care Act uh, have been extremely important. Mr. Roy. Thank you, sir. Ultimately, I think that I would probably survive the data angle. Data and the way you describe the issue is very important to investigators. I talk about it in my testimony about how we are catching criminals in the act as opposed to finding out 90 days uh, later that they are stealing money from us and by that time they are already gone on their way to, to the next, uh, next scheme. What concerns me more are the funding aspects, the, uh, the long-term funding for, for HICFAC. Uh, OIG, OI is, uh, is human resources driven, and I need to ensure that I have the funding to keep bodies on the ground and engaged in the process. Other than that, I think Dr. Budetti and I, I, would, uh, I think I would be okay uh, getting the data out of Mr. Budetti. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, the Chair will now recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a couple of questions. <clears throat> Ms. Lynch, you said for every dollar that is spent on uh, prosecutions, you get $7 back, or you, you recover $7? Yes, roughly, sir, yes. Uh, the estimated fraud over the last several years has been $150 billion each year since 2008. Uh, I don't know how that dovetails into the, the, the results you say you are getting. If you are getting $7 back for every $1 invested, then you are saying that you actually need a lot more money in order to uh, stop the fraud that is so prevalent, right? Well, I think that um, certainly funding is, uh, is an important part of what we need. The other tools that we have mentioned in terms of, um, again, I would defer to the agencies in terms of changing their protocols are also very important as well. But the resources that we have enable us to sharpen our focus on these particular activities, and they do bring great benefits back to the taxpayers. Well, the system that we have right now, just if you are getting $7 back for every $1 that you get for investigations or prosecutions, uh, this is just overwhelming you. There is just no way that you are going to be able to really make a big dent in an estimated $150 billion in fraud each year. Uh, I mean, if you are doing such a good job, which I don't, dis dis I, I don't disagree that you are, uh, but if you are getting $7 back for every $1 that is being invested in you and we have got $150 billion in fraud each year, my gosh, uh, you would need $20 billion in order to keep up the 7 to 1 ratio if you went and, and got everybody. So uh, it just seems like to me it is almost an insurmountable task that you have before you to stop the waste, fraud and abuse or even make a big dent in it because there's so much, because it is so prevalent. Well, Congressman, I would, would prefer not to view any crime problem as insurmountable, but more as a challenge to be met. And I think we have a number of tools. <laughs> we have the civil enforcement as well. We have a number of options 
there. I would, I would rather, certainly rather not give up on the problem. No, no, I don't want you to give up. Don't misunderstand. I just think that the whole system needs to be revamped because no matter how hard you work, all of you collectively, to stop fraud, waste and abuse in the system, it is not going to work. I mean, when you have got an estimated 70 to $234 billion a year in fraud, as, as hard as you work with the money we give you, you are never going to be able to make a big dent in it. The system needs to be revised. We need to, we need to do something like, uh, and this has nothing to do with you, but it seems to me that the government ought to provide a mechanism for people to buy insurance through private sources rather than have the bureaucracy try to contain waste, fraud and abuse, because you can't do it. As hard as you work, and I am sure you all work very hard, if you get $7 back for every $1 in, 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 in investment that you make and we still have $150 billion a year in fraud, the system is not working. And it is not going to get any better unless we take a hard look at the system and revise the whole thing. And I think that is what we are talking about right now. And I hope that both sides of the aisle, my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, will take a hard look at that. Because if we still have $150 billion in fraud that we can't stop, and we haven't been stopping, and we have people who are working so diligently, like Ms. Lynch and the others, and, and they are getting $7 back for every $1 we give them for investigations, it is a task that is not doable. And so we have to look at a different way to deal with the problem of health care, and the system needs to be revised. Obamacare, I know you call it something else, but we call it Obamacare. Obamacare is only going to exacerbate the situation. So I think we need to, as a Congress, go back and take a look at the whole system and try to make this uh, uh, system more responsive to uh, the individual. In other words, if they buy insurance from a health care company and we provide a mechanism for them to do that, we will be able to keep track of the losses and whether or not there is fraud, at least uh, to a much greater degree than we are right now. The gentleman yield. The gentleman yield. Uh, sure, I'll be glad. Yeah, to just very quickly, we were just on this side. We were trying to figure out what, where you where, just give us the site for your 150 billion dollars since you. Sure, uh, sure. The New England Healthcare Institute estimates that the U.S. wasted 150 billion each year since 2008. But the but the losses or the the, the waste and fraud and abuse has ranged from 70 billion to 234 billion. Even if you take the lower figure, these people who are doing a good job, and I'm not criticizing them. I'm just saying there's not enough money that we can give them to enforce the laws that will overcome at least 70 billion, and the estimate is it's 150 billion here. And I thank the gentleman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Indiana. Uh, I will uh, recognize myself now for five minutes. Ms. Taylor, do you agree with the president when he said there's 900 billion dollars of waste, fraud, and abuse in Medicare and Medicaid? I think that's probably a better question for Dr. Boudetti. <laughs> I, I, I'm not. I've not. Just, I mean, yes or no? I mean, it, it is. I, is it a nine hundred billion dollar a year problem? I'm really not familiar with that quote or that number. I'm not familiar at all. All right. Well, that. let me ask you. There was a chart put up initially that had, you know, we want to go from pay and chase to to verify, and 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 it strikes me in the frustration that I have heard listening to the testimony or the frustration that I have felt listening to it is that it is, uh, uh, the strategy seems to be pay and then pay again to investigate and then pay again to prosecute and then pay again to pretrial services to do a PSI and then pay to probation and pay to the marshals and pay to the Bureau of Prisons. What I want to know is when are we going to invest the same amount of money in stopping the fraud before it happens? We cannot investigate and prosecute our way out of this problem. So, Mr. Roy, let me ask you this. Last night I was reading, and, and I could be wrong. Let's say I am. I, I, I counted 55 different recommendations that have been made with respect to reforming Medicare and Medicaid that have not been implemented. 55. Let's say I am off by a, a 25. Let's go down to 25. Or let's just pick your issue, durable medical equipment. Can you give us specific things that should be done to start ferreting out fr fraud, waste, abuse, whichever of the three you want to call it, with respect to durable medical, medical equipment? I would go back to my earlier testimony, sir, and concentrate on provider enrollment, scrutinizing Right. Those. Criminal background checks. Absolutely. Okay. And what else? Uh, Make sure they are familiar with the policies and procedures so they can't claim they didn't know. 
Make sure they have an office and have office hours. Make sure that they have product to actually provide to, to, to durable uh, medical equipment uh, beneficiaries. Okay. Again, we're I also would, would throw in there that you have to look at the environment in which they are working. In Los Angeles, for example, we once had 25 durable medical equipment companies in a, uh, a five-mile radius serving a very, very small All of which can be done w w with, with a with a site visit, right? A criminal background check, an interview, and a site visit. It is not high mass. So I would ask you, Dr. Budetti or, or Ms. Taylor, why hasn't that been done? Well, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Gowdy and I, uh, Chairman Gowdy. And I uh, must say I agree with you that uh, this is exactly what needs to be done, and that is exactly what we are doing. Uh, as of uh, Friday of March 25th, our uh, major regulation took effect that uh, pu put into place risk-based screening for applications to be new providers and suppliers. I, I, I don't want and, to interrupt you. And we are putting, we're putting can, exactly those kind of screens into place, sir. But, but can you appreciate the frustration of, of, of this problem having not just arisen in March of this year? It has been a problem for a number of years. And I think folks question what takes us so long to deal with that is not high math, what he just suggested. Uh, we could have come up with that over lunch. Uh, I, so what is taking so long? I, I can't speak to what happened before I took this job a year ago, but I can tell you that those are some of the same reasons I took the job, and those are exactly the things that we are working on every day. Uh, Mr. Roy, what about uh, home health? G give me a, three things that you would do if you were emperor for the day on, on, with respect to home health. I would go back to, once again, looking at those who, who is coming into our program, who is providing those services. And uh, then, uh, again, I would look at the environment to see how many providers are in a certain area. Does it really make sense to have an exponential amount of providers to, to serve a community that probably doesn't exist? Uh, those are the types of issues I would focus on if I was looking at it from an administrative uh, p position. Dr. D Budetti, do you agree with me that, that, that Ms. Lynch and her colleagues cannot ever prosecute and enforce our way out of this problem? Yes. I think we all agree that we need the, a teamwork approach here, that we need to keep the bad guys out in the first place, uh, not pay them when they are submitting fraudulent claims, and then also go after the ones who do get into the program and who do need to be prosecuted. We can't do away with that side of the, of the equation by any stretch of the imagination. I am not advocating. That would be one of the last things I advocate yes, would sir. be doing away with prosecutors. But uh, how are you going to change the pay and chase model to a verify and then pay? Through our new screening, through our new authorities to uh, declare a moratorium on new enrollments of providers and suppliers when necessary to fight fraud through our new uh, ability to uh, exclude, uh, to uh, uh, keep people out of the Medicaid program when they have been terminated for cause in one state. They are going to be terminated everywhere. Same for Medicare. Uh, we have a number of new authorities that we are putting into, into effect that will have exactly that effect of keeping the bad guys out uh, and, 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 and suspending payments when there is a credible allegation of fraud uh, pending an investigation by our colleagues at the Office of the Inspector General. My so all of those are in place, sir. My time is up, so I am going to ask one very quick question. H have those changes already been implemented, or are they yet to come? Many of them uh, have. The, the, the regulation that I referred to took effect, and we are actively implementing it uh, a, as I speak. And when would you expect the country to have confidence that they are fully implemented? I would expect that all of the uh, uh, advanced uh, technologies and other uh, uh, sophisticated uh, techniques that we are applying uh, will be in place later this year and, uh, and will be well into our payment systems fully integrated uh, by next year. But we are implementing them bit by bit as we go forward, as we learn, as we learn uh, what, what, uh, what we can do uh, in the meantime. But this is, this is something we are working on very diligently every day now, sir. All right. Thank you. You are welcome. Thank you. I want to thank, uh, thank our panel. And we are going to take a five-minute uh, recess. I am going to come down there and, and thank you all personally for coming, and then we will set up for the next panel.